this is Mark Wade, writer of Superman Birthright, and you're listening to Krypton Report. Up in the sky, look! It's a bird! It's a plane! It's a Krypton Report! <laughs> host Tyler and welcome to Krypton Report, a podcast dedicated to all things Superman, Supergirl. We're going to look at the Supergirl TV series as well as the Krypton TV series, anything that has to do with the characters in their world. Comics, movies, TV shows, we will talk about everything and anything. We are part of the Southgate Media Group podcasting network. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, at Krypton Report. You can also email us at kryptonreportpod at gmail.com. If you get a chance to go over to iTunes, Apple Podcasts, please leave us a review to help us get better. You can find me personal at JTY Patrick on Twitter and everything else. You can buy a Krypton Report t shirt at tpublic.com. Check it out. They have all sizes, colors, styles of shirts. Just go to tpublic.com and search Krypton Report and you'll see our logo. And every time you buy a shirt, it helps support other podcasts from southgatemedia.com. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Yep. Welcome to Krypton Report. This is the next one of our catch-up episodes. I am Tyler, your host, as your Superman Blue. And with me, as always, fighting crime, defending the innocent, fighting for truth, justice, the American way is Mr. James Cole, the Superman Red. Hello. Welcome, James. What's funny is, uh, so Solomon got this Superman versus Doomsday book from the library. And he's, okay. he's loving it. And um, so much that he read Jania, made Jania read it to him before bed. Oh, yeah. And, and now he's like, I want to watch Doomsday. So I put in Superman <laughs> Doomed. For him, <laughs> he's upstairs watching it all his life, getting ready to go to bed. So, oh, nice. He's like, which one's Doom? He's like, watch Doomsday, Daddy. I'm like, right. <laughs> excellent. Hey, um, quick news that we forgot to kind of discuss last time is I guess Henry Cavill has been tust- talking with um, Christopher McQuarrie, the director of the last couple of Mission Impossible movies, since they just finished up Mission Impossible 6, about doing the Man of Steel 2. What are your thoughts on this? Um, I have enjoyed the last few um, uh, Mission Impossible movies, the last couple Mission Impossible movies uh, that he's worked on. Uh, I'm excited to see uh, Fallout. And, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, he, he's, got a, he's definitely got a good eye for, for, the, uh, uh, for the extreme visuals. That, you know, would be required for Superman. And, uh, I mean, I'm hoping a Man of Steel 2 is, is close to being added to the slate. And Absolutely. I do too. I hope it's something maybe we'll see it from Comic Con. Uh, I don't have a problem with Christopher McQuarrie. I've seen, you know, a few of his films. He's done a lot of writing. I've been impressed with his action. And uh, obviously, I mean, Tom Cruise is a, you know, a superstar, quote unquote, and say, uh, but he's worked with him multiple times, and then Cavill just worked with him and seemed to like him, or else he wouldn't be talking with him. So um, and we all know that Cavill's passionate about yeah. the character and bringing the character back and really continue on, continuing on what he set up in Justice League. Um, so, yeah, I'm, com- I'm cool with it. Not who I would have picked, but definitely not a bad choice at all. Yeah, uh, Henry Cavill is... is- very passionate about playing Superman. It's it's great to have you know somebody with that much passion who, who loves playing such an iconic character. And I mean, even with what he's been giving, how been given as as kind of how uneven um, it's been, uh, you know, kind of just just the beginning, and then you know the death, and then the the kind of campy resurrection, you know, what he's been given, he's done a great job with. And, you know, I hope a, a, a standalone, another standalone movie, he'll be given a lot more to work with. And, uh, you know, he, he's definitely my, you know, the new generation Superman and he's, he's been great at, at it. Exactly. Um, 
Um, um, and then the I, next... I like. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, I was just gonna. I like the uh, the responses he gave at um, uh, CinemaCon. Uh, every every outlet that asked him about um, that were talking to him about Mission Impossible obviously brought up playing Superman again, and he had to give the same response to like three or four different outlets that he's been in talks. And they're trying to talk to people who make those kind of decisions to add it to the slate. And it was just the same thing, like three, four different times to different outlets. I mean, the guy wants to do it. Let's let him do it, you know? Oh, big time. He, if, he, if he has the passion for it, you know, he obviously does. I mean, just, just to get in physical shape to be Superman, you know, which you know, he's done an amazing job with that as well. Yes, he has. Now, the other big news, which is multi-layered, is they officially announced the DC streaming service, which they are calling DC Universe. Um, we don't have a date of when it's launching, but we got the logo for Titans, Young Justice Outsiders, the Harley Quinn animated series, and then they announced another live-action, only-on-DC-Universe show that's going to be... Produced by James Wan as Swamp Thing. I am really excited about that. Um, I I used to watch the I used to watch the movie and the TV show with my grandpa back when I was a little kid, and I uh, watched the animated series as it was short lived. And uh, Swamp Thing's always been an awesome character. He's in in you know especially. Uh, media like like movies and cartoons and stuff he's been underutilized and he's a great character i i totally agree with that um he has been underutilized he is i was a little disappointed by his limitedness in justice league dark um once you get into the green and the red and the rot it's really interesting and i love james wan so i'm really excited to see where this goes yeah, well, definitely with James Wan's history in um, the horror genre, uh, you know, the dark, the swamps, um, the, uh, you know, possibly even like eco-terrorism type stuff. I mean, it could, it could definitely be an interesting show. Looking forward to seeing what comes out of it. I agree. So here we go. We're going to get into it. We're going to start, and we're going to discuss Krypton's sixth episode, Civil Wars. Um, so, I guess it is General Zod. You know, we had talked last time that we were a little shocked that we were, it was, you know, um, General Zod and not... You know, straight up who it is, but yeah. So, what are your thoughts on it being? Uh, well, because Adam says it's uh, General Zod, Superman's greatest villain. Yeah, um, I mean, Adam seems to confirm it that that it's General Zod. Um, you know, the actor is great. His portrayal. Um, coming out as Zod, you know, kind of, uh, saying who he is, saying how much he respected Seg's son. Um, and then, and then no matter the differences, you know, the reason that, you know, Kal-El turned his back on, on Krypton, you know, I think, I think that's kind of, you know, that's, that's his outlook on it. Obviously we all know, no different. Um, you know, from, from Kal-El's point of view, but, uh, his outlook, he, he's done a, a, he's doing a good job. And, and I think the way he was talking, he sounded very, he sounded manipulative. You know what I mean? Trying to yes. give information that, that Seg doesn't know about the future to try and, you know, manipulate him in, in the, in that present time. Um, so I agree. Because what we learn here is that the 
we learned that Adam didn't exactly know all the details of the time traveling villain, and that the villain was not Brainiac that was time traveling, but it was Zod. So the Brainiac yeah. that we are dealing with is the Brainiac of this time. Yeah, it was just a pretty pretty big revelation of the of the season. You know, it's the sixth episode, and the entire time it's believed that Brainiac has come back to stop uh, Kal El when it's actually he's just he's just there. It's it's already it's the history where he does take Candor City. Yes, and it's because of taking Candor that starts to shake the the core of the planet, thus causing you know the destruction of Krypton. We do get a uh, Hall of Justice reference. <laughs> um, well, at least that's what Dodd says is is the taking Candor City was was the reason for it. I mean that that could easily be a, a manipulation of Seg. Oh yeah, you know we're we're going to go with it for now. But yeah, it's mm -hmm. possible. But it could be true. I mean. Um, in a lot of ways, people have said that, you know, Michael Shannon Zod in some light could, you know, not be the villain, if you, depending on your point of view. Mm -hmm. I still don't understand why he wanted to destroy Earth and make a new Krypton when they could just adapt and live on Krypton like gods, um, and raise a whole new generation of Kryptonians on Earth that have amazing powers, but you know, whatever. Um... We're still trying to figure out how the lineage of Zod being Lytus's son and everything, and how the names work and the you know who the father is. So we're going to kind of that's just something to keep kind of in our mind as we go through this episode and this little arc continues to see if we can piece some things together. Um, the curious was, thing about the the curious thing about the lineage there is you know he he's General Zod, but um, wouldn't if she were to marry somebody, say, um, Dev M, wouldn't she be an M at that point? Yep. Or, or do they just take the name of like, or is it like the higher ranking name See, that's is the one that is carried over? All right, I don't so, know. So this is kind of jumping ahead in my notes here, but we learned okay. that Darren Vex married into House Vex. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't a Vex before. And like we learned how, you know, Seg uh, was going to be dubbed a Vex um, and everything. So, I mean, we're, we're, we're kind of learning as we go and kind of piecing it together about, you know, who, what, how the, how the lineage and the name system works. Um, you know, so we're just going to kind of keep our eyes peeled for clues and everything as we get closer um, you know, through all of this, this season. Yes. Um, the next big thing I have is, first of all, I am going to just state this up front. I hate the capital of Krypton. It's called Kryptonopolis. <laughs> okay, I think it's stupid. Yeah. <laughs> Kryptonopolis or Krypton, whatever, however they want to pronounce it, I think it's horrible. Okay? Um... I, I just think it's bad. But we see that they're trying to get um, Dev M onto their side of helping with the coup along with Primus uh, to save Lyda. Um, you know, we hear Zod talk about Cal negatively and that angers Adam, but then Seg is kind of leaning more towards Zod's side when Seg finds out that Adam didn't so much come to stop Krypton from being destroyed in the future as much as at the moment to save Superman and that kind of causes a problem between uh, the two of them mm -hmm. yeah the, um, the, the him telling him that Krypton was going to be destroyed in 200 years um you know that that really drove a wedge in between the 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 trust he had for Adam at the time. And you know what this this season is? I don't know if I want to see Adam Strange 
carried over into a second scene. Because I feel like they're not really giving him anything to do at the moment. They're not really making him Adam Strange. You know, it's like, this is a chance to introduce a new character and do something. But right now, all we're getting is just a character named Adam Strange. Like, it could be literally anybody right now. Um, so that that kind of just, like, let's, let's make him more of the character. Um, we see Jaina. We have a, a Sagittari Guard officer that comes and reporting on behavior, and Jaina has to take him out like a boss, which was kind of sad. But uh, still no, still no Black Zero. We have not really met anyone from Black Zero, and I'm starting to think does Black Zero even really exist? Yeah, I'm, it, it kind of seems like it's. Uh you know, use this as an excuse or, or maybe even a, a terror tactic from the voice and, and, you know, the people underneath him to, uh, you know, kind of keep people in line and, and him in power. Exactly. Like, we, so they've never been able to have any real evidence about its existence. Um... Una, Una, is so sweet. She hugs Brainiac, the voice. <laughs> and then we get into what the most interesting part, of, I think, in the episode is the symbol that's guarding the weapon that Zod is talking about is a sigil of the House of El and the House of Zod symbol imposed together. Yeah. I yeah. When I first saw it, I was like, "Well, I was like, that's obviously the the L sigil in there." But until they got closer to it, I did. I was like, "Well, that looks like the the L and and the Zod symbol um, overlapped." And then, did you catch the reference that Zod makes about kneeling? They say, uh, "Like get down." I don't and, recall it. Like, kneel down, and he says. Uh, not a position I'm used to actually having to take or something like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I do recall that now. Um, and then we see what the actual weapon is that can destroy Brainiac that's violent and destructive. And what was that weapon? Doomsday. And he looks sweet. Like he's all frozen looking and like encased in ice, but he looks he looks like Doomsday. Like he looked good. Bones out and everything. Yeah, he, he had bone protrusions in his face. The way his arms were crossed, you could see the bone protrusions um from his arms. Um his face looked a little more I don't know, maybe a little more uh closer to the comic book. Uh, adaptation of Doomsday's face. A uh, little less, uh, I guess, Ninja Turtle, as people have referenced Doomsday from BBS. I just got <laughs> mad that they just... I wish he wouldn't have got to be basically, like, look like a little giant electric circuit and just, like, had grown more bones. Like, he just yeah. had bones ripping out of him more as they fought him, and he didn't turn into, like, an electrical-looking monster. That that the electricity thing is what really like bugged me about it. It, yeah. Um, I mean, it didn't it didn't really like bug me like the the I don't know the the energy projections that that he had going on, but um, I mean that was odd just to see how it kept you know just blowing up like that bigger and bigger. Uh, I did think it was odd. It was something new. To my knowledge, mm-hmm. uh, but uh, I I thought when they were doing when they were doing Doomsday and from the early shots of what he looked like, I thought that like in the fight, as you know, Superman and Wonder Woman were were hitting him. You know, I would have thought that maybe like a- as they were hitting him, like bones were breaking, things like that, and protruding. But each time he got hit, he would become stronger, yeah. you know, and that the bones would just like just keep like popping out. And by the end, he would look more, more spine, you know, 
razor sharp bones sticking out like like bone protrusions. And I agree with you. That's kind of where I thought it was going. Um, but you know, we got what we got. And then, of course, General Zod gets shot and is injured, and they're escaping. And what did you think about the end, the final scene? Uh, that was that was pretty wild. Um, it kind of, it kind of reminded me just a little bit of um, Brainiac on Smallville using his liquid metal metal type tentacles to, to get people in the head, you know? Yep. But the way it was just like, like mass, you know, they, they were there to assassinate the voice and, you know, the brainiac sentry in him, it was just, he was like, Nope, ain't having this. And boom. <laughs> takes it all out in the mind. Like mm-hmm. he just, um, I was like, wow, oh, it was intense. The, the kind of, right. The the one thing I did like about this Doomsday was he wasn't like as giant as the Doomsday in the movie. You know, like he was much bigger than than people. You know, he was maybe two, three people like large, you know, in stature. Mm-hmm. But he wasn't like like monstrous, like like 12 13 feet tall like he was in the movie um and also it makes me curious about like because because the that changes the history the comic book history of him being out in space for for 250 million years Uh, i mean this this could be a doomsday you know because yeah like it's been stated before that it was uh what do you call it? Like a Kryptonian defect or it was an ancient Kryptonian thing. And so, I mean, it could be (laughs) just a different, not the doomsday that, that kills Superman. Right. Yeah. Um, it just, I, I thought that if it was, if it was say that doomsday, that like the destruction of the planet, like the creature being more powerful than that would, you know, it would send him flying, hurtling through space and, and crash on Earth, you know, 30 or, well, yeah, 30 some years or whatever after the destruction of Krypton. And that would be the time when it becomes, you know, comes to the death of Superman. Mm-hmm. Just in, in this version, this timeline. Yeah. I mean,. So it, it ends in a cool place, and definitely I feel like it's going to kind of segue into the next one directly. Um, but, yeah, I liked it. I mean, this is probably, as of right now, has been my favorite episode, just because I feel like it, it gave us a lot more of the history, character, familiarity, and just kind of felt more like the show that we want to see, if that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, um, it, it kind of furthers the, the direct story. You know, last one, there was a lot of history. And, uh, you know, it gives us the answers to the questions we were asked about. Right yet. So, so that was, it raises more questions about Adam. Yes, it does. What he knows, what he doesn't know, what he's doing. And if he, like... What I mean, what has he told us that maybe is not so truthful? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, Seg in this episode, in this episode, told him to uh, ride his Zeta thing back to where he came from. I think that was something similar to the quote. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean. Let's uh, jump on in. We're going to switch gears a little bit, keep on the Kryptonium, but we're going to talk about Supergirl and her episode in Search of Lost Time. So, Supergirl, blah, 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 blah. All right. (laughs) Now, this episode 
Yes. We, one thing we forgot to mention when we talked about Shot Through the Heart is Marin, John's father, is basically developing Martian Alzheimer's. He's forgetting things, and I think it's just extremely sad. Um, because this, this starts the beginning with, you know, um, what do you call it? Um, they're playing charades and everything and having a good time. And there's things that, um, you can just see like in the subtleties of the acting about, you know, Marin and what he's suffering. And one thing I really liked was, um, um, crap, why am I drawing a blank? They make a joke about when Sean was little, he used to blame stuff on his invisible friend, who was a fifth dimensional imp named Zook. Ow. Oh. I almost was like if he was going to say Mr. Mixapitalic or something, I was gonna be like, what? But I thought that was cool. Uh, about Zook. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, the, uh, the, the acting um, in this whole thing, uh, I mean, from, from John's father um, to John himself and uh, the relationship that, that they have with, with Alex in this whole thing, because Alex was the one who, who uh, d determined that he, was, that, he start, that he was having these, these memory problems. Yeah, and I mean, uh, it's just... I mean, David Harewood, and I can't ever remember his name right now, the actor who plays Marin. I had it written down, but I can't find it. This is great acting from them. Like, this is emotional, like, heart-beating, heavy acting. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, there's a, there's a very good uh, a relationship between those two. But then there's also the the act the relationship between um, uh, David Harewood and uh, Alex. Yes, they're 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 so they're so close. You know, they're almost like like a father and daughter um, uh, relationship. A little less uh, uh, boss and and uh, you know more more agent and and soldier mm -hmm. kind of thing. Um, you know, they do, they definitely have a, a, a familial bond and, and that shines through with her concern for, for Jean's father and, and, uh, John and the concern for Jean what, that he's going to have to, uh, deal with this. Exactly. So that's kind of part of the episode and then the setup, but one of my favorite parts in this episode is at the beginning where Supergirl's going to go into action and everybody looks over and she's like slowly unbuttoning her shirt and she says, what? I like this shirt. <laughs> yeah, I like that rip. part. I, I laugh because it is like you think about like you rip open the shirt, like you just like totally destroy the shirt and everything. Can you imagine the cost of buttons that Superman and Supergirl would have to go through? Man, you know what? I would like have Velcro <laughs> shirts or like something. Like I would find a way. I'd be like, this junk ain't cheap. <laughs> um, now we see we'll, we'll kind of a character we haven't seen for a little while. Basically, gets a really strong arc in this one. Well, not really arc, but Lena. We see that Lena has Sam in a coma, and she's doing some research to try to find out. Because Lena, I love how smart Lena is. Mm -hmm. Granted, she still hasn't figured out who Supergirl is, but you know what? That's another story. But, you know, she's trying to figure out what's triggering Sam to become Rain. And I love that she pulls up, like, this timeline of when Sam's blackouts are and the activity of Rain. But what I, what I can't help but laugh is, can you not put two photos up, like, together? One of Sam and one of Rain. And be like, don't you kind of look, I mean, like, don't you guys look the same? <laughs> um, right. And uh, well, you know, with shape changing aliens and things like that, I mean, how can you just trust the picture? I guess. You know, I, kinda, I really wish that the like the rain mask was more like 
bone. Looked at like her yeah. face changed or whatever and had like this protruding bone in it. It didn't just look like her with goth lipstick or something. Yeah. Uh, the interesting thing about that, the change though, is she does, Lena does say that her DNA changes. Right. That she, as Sam, she can be hurt, but then as Rain, you know, she's so powerful. She can't be hurt like that. As long as they don't use black kryptonite to split her Kryptonian half from her human half, I'm good. Okay. <laughs> Absolutely. But it also makes me wonder, are the, all the world killers Kryptonian based? Or are they just more like, because Rain seems to be very based on Kryptonian powers. You know, like an anti-Supergirl. But the other two are different. They feel more like, for lack of a better term, science experiments. Kryptonian science experiments. You know, the world killers, were they, were they made by that cult. Um, mm hmm but we get when makes the comment that he fixed Monel's old suit, and that the suit was made from studying, um, you know, Supergirl and they and Superman's suit. And frankly, when he walks out full on suit, like his boots look better than Superman's boots. Like what they do with the Monel suit, I wish they would like the the way the belt looks, the boots. And like just the like the added color of the blue streak. I wish they just reversed that in the Superman suit. Mm -hmm. Like give us a better that same kind of belt with different colors, and give us those better looking boots than you did for the Superman suit. Um, and I really want Monel to meet Superman because I'm like really liking Monel this season. And well, I, at this point, he's the more at this point he's the more experienced hero. Um, you know, in the second season, he, he was only there for a matter of months. And then he travels in time and he is a hero with the Legion for seven years. Yeah. So at this point, he's he's got four years more experience at, at being a superhero than, than Kara does. And so his character is matured. Yes. And we'll bring that back up here in a minute um, with, what, with, with what Kara says. Um. Side note, somehow they really need to have Phil Morris, the actor, appear in Supergirl in some relation to John. Like, if they could get him in here in some way, in a flashback or something before Marin is gone, those are like the three Martian Manhunters. You know, mm -hmm. the voice from the Justice League that I associate when I read a Martian Manhunter comic or a character, the current and then the Smallville version. Uh, we just need that. But I like that they were like studying footage from the Supergirl and Rain fight and how they were really analyzing her footwork and Monel, like just the way he talked about she's more of a raw, she's a creature, she's toying with her food kind of thing and how she's acting towards Supergirl. I thought that was really cool. Like they're actually taking it up. Um, now we do see Marin. And uh, Jean talking, and Marin makes a joke about Zook. That was pretty funny that he had Jean, like, believing for a second. <laughs> what are your thoughts on the Jimmy Lena relationship? <clears throat> um, I mean, it's nicer. I mean, it's kind of nice that, they, that they're uh, giving Jimmy something to do. Um, he, he kind of had fallen, fallen by the wayside. Yeah. Uh, they, they, they've kind of like, it seems like recently moved away from cat co a little bit. Um, it's, it is weird cause I feel like I need to like, I really can't wait to rewatch this entire season in one sitting just because that break was so long that you forget little details. Mm -hmm. You remember the big stuff, but the small stuff, you know, now that cat is owned by Elcor. And everything. And then, like, did they just basically toss the Guardian stuff away? Like, there's, like, not yeah. anything with it. Like, I mean, I didn't really yeah, like I it. Should... But, right. I, I just, from a character story, I don't feel like we ever went to a place where he decided to stop. Yeah, no, it just seems to have definitely just gone in the background. Um, they, they do have a... Um, a mature relationship um you know they they each discuss you know having secrets that that they can't be told especially with lena 
um, and and being who she is and, and in the position she is with uh, business and, and everything like that, being Luther. But, uh, you know, Jimmy, and you can't really tell her that either, but Jimmy has his own secrets. You know, obviously Guardian uh, is a secret of his, but also uh, Kara being Supergirl is a secret of his. A secret that's not his to tell, but a secret nonetheless. Yeah, exactly. Because, I mean, I can't remember if there's a, there's a line coming up, but I just can't remember which episode it was in. If it's on the new one I just watched, because I kind of was watching through all of them, which I didn't mean to. It just kind of happened. Um, but... Um, the thing I do like about Lena, you were talking about her intelligence and everything before. We, we With this episode, we we finally get the answer to, did she see her eyes change before the break? Mm-hmm. And... I think she did. I think when she saw, I think when she saw the eyes and she said, I know what's happening to you. I think she did associate rain with, with her at that moment. And she needed to do what she is doing to confirm. But, oh, yeah. uh, she does a really good job at this point because Sam won't believe, Sam doesn't even believe her at this point when she's telling her that she's rain and she gives her the timeline and everything. And and she pushes her, saying that she wouldn't she wouldn't let her see Ruby, you know that that Ruby Ruby's not safe with her, and she pushed her to the point that that she rained out and she videotaped it. And when when Sam came back too, she showed her the tape. I like that rained out. That sounds sweet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> because she had to see proof, you know. And I don't know, Sam just her whole actions and everything was kind of annoying me, but whatever. I just think she could be smarter. Um, yeah, she was in. She's in some serious denial. I mean, you might be too. You know, thinking about you were the person who, like, literally dismembered these these criminals and things like that, as they talked about earlier in the season, I believe. Yeah, I mean, I I would be, but at the same time, I I don't I don't know, because she's giving some really good information, and you're. You're already scared about, hey, um, like what, what's going, what's going on with me? Like this timeline stuff starting to make sense. Um, could this be real? Maybe, maybe not. Um, but I just feel like Lena's doing everything she can and really doing well with it. Um, so moving forward. I like when John comes clean about what everything his father is going on to Alex and Kara. And then Kara says, my uncle Jarrell used to say, the son becomes the father, the father, the son. Um, Mm -hmm. I was like, well, in this instance right here, it makes a lot more sense than it does in the Superman movies. Yeah, it it really does. It, It apply so much more you know because i've always kind of had like that sounds cool but at the same time kind of sounds dumb sometimes um you just gotta have like the right context for it and yeah we really yeah it sounds really good but the fact that you know his parents his parents died with the planet it kind of seems just a little a little flat but in the real you know in the real world as as you know, parents get older and, and they require more help, um, especially in this in um, Moran's case and, and John's case, yeah. Alzheimer's and stuff like that. You know, I mean, you think nursing homes these days. You know, when people yeah. get old and they require that help. You know, I mean, that's that's the context that that line comes from, but. It, Kind of falls flat with Superman when his parents. Yeah, I mean they try to do something died. like in Superman Two, where depending on what cut you you watch, you know Jarrell, the power of Jarrell in the fortress, you know revives Kal El's powers. Yeah, okay. Um, and then you know we we'll won't even talk about Superman Returns, but one thing we kind of skipped over, Monel knows how to fight with his cape, because his cape is smart cloth. 
and he's teaching Supergirl how to use her cape in this like really cool like kata type thing of learning how to fight with your cape. What do you think about the whole cape fighting? Um, I I do. Um, I think it's I think it's a useful tool. Um, in in the fight, uh, the the best part I, I enjoyed about it, um, was was the hologram, um, of of their fight of her fight with Rain, trying to uh, trying to pick apart uh, pick apart her fighting style and and focus on weaknesses that she could exploit, especially with using the cape. Yeah, I feel like. They're gonna have to find some some sort of like big way of stopping rain. It's gonna be something more than just like hand to hand. Yeah. Now the other thing is what we learn is Marin is doing a prayer, a Martian prayer technique that moves memories to the part of his brain that's functioning the best. But when he's doing it, it's letting out psychic bursts. Now, that was the catalyst that caused an issue at the beginning of the episode where Supergirl fought, I can't remember the alien type, in a, fo- in a photo booth, which was hilarious. Because they're really <laughs> susceptible, because they're empaths, to the psychic energy. And um, he starts doing it while he's at the DEO, because Jean brings him to the DEO, trying to think he can protect him. And then it causes Kara to kind of go off the deep end and fight with Monel. It causes Wynn and another agent to start fighting. Um, it causes all the prisoners to get freed that are in the DEO. I thought that was kind of crazy because like we got to see all these, uh, you know, prisoners and then just aliens we hadn't seen in a while. Um, mm-hmm. But my favorite line is when you hear a person scream, Winslow shot. And Wynn says, Pam from HR? <laughs> and, you know, it's a very emotional when Jean eventually has to convince his father what he's doing. And his father basically starts running from him. <clears throat> and, um, you know, Jean's trying to put some dampening technology that's ke- to keep his brain from going berserk but Marin will not allow it and it's it's crazy you know yeah um uh well what what's interesting is is Marin is more is farther gone than he even realizes you know he's he's doing this Martian technique and he doesn't even realize that his his psychic waves are escaping like they they bring that up that um he would know if if they were if they were getting out of hand, and that's when he's denying him the the dampening technology. And there's a line earlier where Marin remembered the the alien, the empath alien. He says, "I know, I mm-hmm. felt it." And then when John tells him again about it, he's like, "They're here." Like he doesn't remember or know that they were actually he was affecting um that alien. So. And I mean that's you know that's that's pretty much the episode there. Um, it ends with Kara and Monel flying and a bunch of dead birds falling. Oh, that was a really interesting um, shot to end on. Yeah, yeah, Sig- signaling that pestilence is is the next episode. So, which what I-, I did like in that episode real quick was yeah. the um, we saw the all those uh, aliens uh, all those aliens that were captured um, escape and uh, the white Martian came out fighting and John you know last time he was fighting some white Martians he got he got handed to him a few times before that uh, but this time around protecting his father, he, he really gave it to that white Martian and put it down. Oh, yeah. He he did. And I really love the story of the father and the son. Maybe because I'm a father with a son. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, like it gets to <laughs> more so now than bef- it would have before. Um, yeah, it's a it's a different it's a different thing after you have kids. I think things affect you differently. All right. So, what would you rate on a on a ten scale? What would you rate this episode of Krypton? And then, what would you rate this episode of Supergirl? Um. Well, this episode of Krypton uh, was, was a step up, uh, a step in the right direction. Um, Krypton is uh, easily a nine. I agree. And, and then uh, this episode of Supergirl, um, very good, uh, very emotional, um, some good, uh, some good high action beats, and uh, uh, as. As a second episode in the return, um, a very strong, uh, very strong episode, and I'd probably give it a nine as well. All right, that is our thoughts this week for Supergirl and Krypton. Stay tuned for some more information, and remember, look up in the sky. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook at Krypton Report. You can also email us at kryptonreportpod at gmail.com. If you get a chance to go over to iTunes, please leave us a review to help us get better.